Well, thank you everybody for making time to join us this afternoon for one of the Dean Speaker Series events. I'm um, obviously not Dean Steph Bertozzi. Uh, I'm Kim McPherson. I'm part of the faculty group here in the School of Public Health in Health Policy and Management. And I'm just really excited to not only be here today to introduce Jessica, but also to hear what she has to say because this topic is uh, very relevant and near and dear to my heart. And also one that I find a lot of our graduate students are particularly interested in um, from a variety of fronts. Uh, I actually suggested Jessica to the Dean's team um, because I got at the opportunity to see her I don't know six or eight months ago at the Commonwealth Club and uh, I was really struck by her comments and her her empathy and her thoughts about how do we change the model that we've sort of been locked into um, and how do we kind of open our minds and think about this differently and a lot of that begins with different kinds of communication and different types of ways that we interact with each other within families and then between caregivers and patients and caregivers and, and, and providers and families so I'm really excited to, to hear this today. Um, just a little bit about Jessica before I ask her to come join us. Jessica um, is uh, both a critical care and palliative care physician at Highland Hospital in Oakland, so she's local, uh, which is wonderful. She went to Stanford University and Case Western Reserve, um, and she also got her Master's of Public Health here at Berkeley, so she's an alumni. Turns out we missed each other by a year, but we share some favorite professors. Um, she did some of her medical training in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's, uh, and then pulmonary critical care in, uh, here in San Francisco, UCSF, um, and has been board certified certified in palliative care since 2010, and I think that's such an amazing combination to both um, have the intensivist, the intensive care perspective, and the palliative care side by side, and we'll hear about that. Um, beyond her clinical practice, um, she co-founded a company in 2005 called Vital Decisions. It's a telephone counseling service. Um, really allows patients and families to be much more actively involved in decision making, really trying to facilitate that. Uh-oh. I think we went silent too long there. Uh-oh. Gonna have to have Jessica come back up and do that. Um, in addition to the company, she also so um, writes extensively. I actually just read, reread uh, a blog that she did, uh, I think about April 17th in the New York Times uh, in the well area. It was a very heart moving um, story, first person, about what happened when someone was discovered, a uh, homeless woman, and brought into the, um, the ICU and sort of the, the challenging uh, that faces not only the physicians but the patient uh, as well. So I, I encourage you to read that. Um, she has a book coming out uh, February 2017, uh, which is very exciting. And we'll just discussing maybe doing another event around that book when it comes out. And a particularly exciting note is she was recently featured in a short documentary uh, called Extremis. It uh, had a debut premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival where it won uh, Best Short Documentaries, which is really exciting. And then it was shown here in San Francisco at the International Film Festival. The good news for the rest of us who missed that is that it will be available on Netflix in September uh, and potentially other outlets as well. So we're very, very excited about that. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to invite Jessica up and allow her to begin her remarks and uh, take us through this. So Jessica, welcome. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to have to ask my son to come up and fix the technology. <laughs> Thank goodness for the young people. I, I really don't. Okay. Okay. Are we? <laughs> okay. I just needed to sign in. Such a pleasure to be here, and thank you all so much for having me. Kim, thank you so much for the warm introduction. I'm going to start us right out and tell you that I went into medicine to be like these guys. They were heroic. They were lifesavers. There was nothing mundane about them. And there was always something that they could pull out of their hats at the 11th hour to save the day. And that's how I found myself in 2003 at the bedside of this patient. It wasn't actually this patient, but it was a patient like this who was very, very ill, inserting a Quinton catheter, which is a dialysis catheter, into her neck. I was getting ready for it. The, I was a new intensive care unit physician at University Hospital in new, Newark, New Jersey. I was very excited. I had a medical student, and I was asked by the team, the primary care team, to please put in this dialysis catheter because they had a patient who was not doing well. She had very serious metastatic breast cancer. She had gotten very ill from the chemotherapy, uh, which had been, uh, she had several rounds of chemotherapy, and this last round had knocked out her kidneys, and at this point she was acidotic, her blood pressure was dangerously low, and her potassium was dangerously high, and they wanted to do dialysis right away. And so I was very happy to oblige to put in this catheter, and I brought my medical student into the room, we sterilized the patient's neck with metadine. We got 
the patient comfortably in bed. We tied down her arms. We then prepped the, the area with a big sterile field. We put our gowns and gloves on, and we were just standing at the head of the bed. I had her head in my hands like this, and I turned it to the side because I wanted to be able to see her internal jugular vein a little bit better. And then I asked the nurse to lower the head down so that her feet were elevated so that I could get a little bit more plumpness into that internal jugular vein so that I'd be more likely to get that catheter in. And at that very moment, I noticed that someone was standing in the doorway and looking at me. And it was Pat Murphy. And Pat was an advanced practice nurse at University Hospital. And she ran the recently founded family support service in our intensive care unit. And quite frankly, I didn't know much about what they did, um, but I did know that she was always underfoot and always looking over my shoulder and very critical of what I was doing. And I found it very annoying and frustrating, but I didn't worry about it too much. But now she was standing there and she looked very angry. And without any words to me, she, stood, she took her hand and she went like this, call the police, they're, they're torturing a patient in the ICU at University Hospital. Now, I was pretty shaken. I knew that this was a pretend phone. And I knew that I wasn't actually going to be taken away in handcuffs or lose my license. I realized the police weren't going to come and get me, and I really wasn't in terrible trouble, but I, all, I felt this sense of being in trouble with myself. And I was really, really uncomfortable with what I was doing. And if I was really honest with myself, which I sort of was and sort of wasn't at that moment, I had been feeling this way for a very, very long time. This patient was dying, and I knew that. This catheter was not going to help her, and it was actually going to hurt her and be risky. Her husband was out in the waiting room, and he thought she might get better. She wouldn't. And on top of that, there was no way that I would have wanted that procedure done on myself in her condition. So none of it made any sense to me. What the heck was I doing? But there were very many pressures on me right at that moment to continue going and to do this line. The nurse, the nurse had set up IV tubing, and that takes a while. And she'd flush it. She was ready and ready and waiting for me to get that catheter in so she could connect the IV tubing to it. The husband, as I mentioned, was out in the waiting room, and he was expecting me to do something to help his wife, as I had told him I was going to do. The primary team had already arranged for emergent dialysis, and it was, the machine was actually waiting there. As soon as I got that catheter in, they were going to whip in and start her on dialysis. The medical student was really eager to get a chance to watch this procedure. This was a very important thing. Medical students really try to rack up as many procedures as they can when they're in the intensive care unit. That is the place to learn how to do procedures. The gown, he was gowned up. He was ready to help. And he was expecting me to go ahead and do this. Medical culture, particularly ICU culture, is not about acknowledging death. That is considered a failure. So to even talk to this husband and to step out of the sterile field that I had kind of wrapped myself around and to go out back to the waiting room and to say to this guy, actually, what I'm going to be doing isn't really going to help her. It will help me access her central veins and her central venous system and do dialysis. But in, ultimately, in the big picture, it's really not going to be of significant benefit to her. That's kind of a hard thing to do when you're enmeshed in this culture as I was. And lastly, I wanted to help. I wanted to do something. And so it all translated into do the line. And I did. And I will tell you that that line did not help that patient. It didn't change her life at all. She died the next day. But it really changed mine. Now, don't get me wrong. OK, I am not against medical technology. I've saved lives with it. I have sent people back to their families. Remember the iron lung, everybody? OK, Most, many of us weren't here, but whatever. We understand the concept. Talk about miracles, right? In the 1940s, thousands of people would have died were it not for this gorgeous metal box, OK? Many, many live for weeks, sometimes months, in these boxes to enhance and support their breathing. Were this not to have happened, they would have died from respiratory failure. And they waited as their bodies fought off the polio virus, and many of them went on to live normal lives.
around the same time in, on the battlefields of World War II and Korea, uh, doctors were learning how to use technology and catheters to resuscitate patients on the battlefield. And this was the first time that had ever really happened. They would come within 10 miles. Everybody remember MASH? They'd come within 10 miles of the battlefield and they would scoop these dying soldiers off of the battlefield and they'd bring them back to their mobile acute surgical hospitals and they would resuscitate them. They would put catheters in and they'd put, they would flood them with fluids and bring their blood pressure back up. And these, many of these patients also went on to live normal lives. So doctors were becoming highly skilled at managing blood pressure, at resuscitating dying bodies, at supplementing respiration, something that had never really before happened. And mechanical support for breathing and for placement of catheters, all of this requires space. These are very big machines. It requires people with a lot of technical skill. And so the intensive care unit was born. Okay, it started out in the 40s with these shock wards, the MASH units that I just mentioned. And then with the respiratory, the respiratory uh, intensive care units where they would support breathing. And then 58, Johns Hopkins had the first multidisciplinary intensive care unit. 59, UCLA and University of Pittsburgh. 60, the first neonatal intensive care unit at Yale. And then it just exploded. And so what started out with it, in those 40s with these respiratory care units has turned into now more than 6,000 ICUs as of 2015 for 5,000 hospitals in the United States. A lot of intensive care units. And each, what again, there's been a spawning, okay? Um, it's amazing how many subspecialty type of ICUs exist at this point. Again, what started with a respiratory care ICU has turned into a medical intensive care unit, a surgical intensive care unit, a neuro intensive care unit, a neurosurgical intensive care unit. For God's sake, there's even a digestive diseases intensive care unit at the U Medical University of South, Calif uh, South Carolina. I mean, I had never heard about that. Has anybody else heard about a digestive diseases intensive care unit? Okay. I was amazed because I've never heard of that. But there is one common theme for all of these intensive care units, okay? And that theme is technology. It's about doing procedures, about propping up organs. And I want you to notice in this, in this picture, this is a pretty prototypical uh, picture of the way most modern ICU our ICUs are set up. In fact, our ICU at Highland is this new, in the new building, which I don't know if any of you have seen this new building that's gone up, are very similar to this. And do you see that big metal column that goes from floor to ceiling? That's called a utility column. And inside of that utility column is, runs electricity, compressed air, oxygen, suction, and the bed slides in next to the utility column and the machines that are going to support the patient for whatever the patient needs are plugged into the utility column during the patient's stay there. It's almost like a plug and play type of situation. And in some ways, it reminds me of a conveyor belt. Now, conveyor belts are not bad, okay? We can relate to the Henry Ford conveyor belts, right? In, in, in the early 1900s, Henry Ford made a conveyor belt to try to enhance and make more efficient the production of Model Ts. A conveyor belt is an automatic, repeated process that goes towards a predictable goal. For Henry Ford, that was to make cars. And so Henry Ford got the time of making a car down from 12 hours to 2.5 hours using his conveyor belt. Now in the ICU, the concept of a conveyor belt would be to enhance organ function, right? to fight disease and ultimately to prolong life. Now for a person who might get better, that's fantastic. You want a rapid fire, predictable, efficient, protocolized approach to propping up organ function. But for those patients who will not get better, who are actually dying, of whom I can tell you there are many who come into an intensive care unit, this experience becomes what I call the end-of-life conveyor belt. So for a dying patient, propping up an organ and keeping them alive on these machines attached to the utility column 
when they are never going to regain the strength to again live on their own independently of these machines can be a trap. And I've seen it many, many times and I've participated in it many, many times and we eventually these connections to the machines become permanent. We surgically place a trach, we place a peg feeding tube and we end up sending patients off a lot to ventilator facilities where they live out the rest of their days attached to machines. And I realized that this was happening. I started to just, and bed five was a real turning point for me. I was like, whoa, this is really happening, and I am participating in this. <clears throat> now, if I had been working on a conveyor belt at Toyota when I was having the types of doubts that I was having with the patient in bed five, I would have been commanded to do something called stop the line. Has anyone here heard of stopping the, heard of stopping the line? It's a, con it's a concept that kind of came up in industry. Toyota started it, that any person who noticed something wrong on the assembly line, on the conveyor belt, was not only okay to, but commanded to stop the line. There's an actual button, and you stop the line if there's anything wrong. You're celebrated to do that. That is part of the culture. But 13 years ago, in the intensive care unit, we just didn't think that way. And even though I was the intensive care unit attending, and I had every power to do it, I didn't know where the stop button was. In fact, I didn't even know there was a stop button. So I was not alone in my suspicions that something was wrong. And in 1996, a few years earlier than, what I, than the story I just told you, the support trial came out. Anybody here heard of the support trial? Okay, it's a really important study in the history of understanding death in America. There were many clinicians who had started being concerned about what they were seeing as these overly mechanized deaths with a lot of suffering. And so the support trial, which was funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and ended up being, it was a two-phase approach, a two-phase trial, and I'll tell you what, it was trying to sort of understand what the heck is going on in this country with patients who are dying. They enrolled about 10,000 patients, just a little bit under 10,000 patients. And all of these were patients with very serious illness who had a very poor prognosis. They were all patients who met one of nine categories for serious illness. The phase one was um, 4,300 patients, so half of the, half of, almost half of the 10,000. And those patients, again, met criteria for serious, serious illness, very poor prognosis. Over the course of the study, which took several months, 1,150 of those 4,300 died. And it was really a descriptive, let's figure out what's going here. Let's just understand the state of the, state of the union here. Let's understand what's going on. What they found was there was incredibly poor communication between physicians and the healthcare team in general and the patients and families. There was no, there was a, a, a profound knowledge gap. For example, of the 31% of those patients in the cohort who did not want DNR, to, be, to be resuscitated. They wanted to be DNR, do not resuscitate, as was found out by the study organizers. Do you know that only 47% of their physicians knew that? Now that's dreadful. That's dreadful communication. And over-medicalization was amazing, and exactly as I've described to you so far, but what they found was really striking. That of these patients who were already so ill, and, for who, and really dying, most of them, there were a median of eight days spent in an intensive care unit before they died. And 38% of those who died actually spent more than 10 days in the intensive care unit before they died. And 46% of those who died spent three days, uh, were on mechanical ventilation within three days of their death. And there was suffering, profound suffering. Of the patients who died who were conscious around the times of their death, it was reported by their families that 50% of them were in moderate to severe pain. That's just a huge amount of people suffering in pain 
who didn't need to be in pain before they died. The second phase of support was an intervention. And what they did was, this was a heroic intervention. It was a huge amount of work. It was huge numbers of people, five study sites, trying to get this, all these study coordinators, study coordinators and nurses to really enhance communication between the patient and the healthcare team, to understand their priorities, their values, their goals, to really feed the prognosis, the prognostic information to the physicians and really show them how seriously ill these people were. And the hope was that some of the outcomes that I just mentioned from phase one would improve with this intervention. No improvement on any of the parameters. Now, disturbingly, you know, that was in 1996. In 2013, Joan Tino looked at a huge Medicare database of more than 800,000 800, patients, just all comers. These were not seriously ill patients, but just a huge database of Medicare patients. And what she found, and she looked at those who died in 2000, those who died in 2005, and those who died in 2009. And what she realized is that the numbers of deaths of pa patients who die either in an intensive care unit or just recently discharged from an intensive care unit has been rising since 2005. So in 2005, it was 24% of patients dying in intensive care units or recently discharged from an intensive care unit. And in 2009, it was 29%. So not moving in the right direction. We're not moving in the right direction. So what is going on? We have support. We've got the support trial. We know people are suffering. We've started the conversation. You're all here. People are talking about this now. It's expensive. We're spending a lot of money. Why isn't this starting to change? Why is it getting worse? Well, I think it's really complicated and really multifactorial. And I'm going to do a little bit of a stab here for you of trying to explain it a little bit more about why is this happening? And just maybe if we start talking about it from a sort of on a deeper psychological level, we can start to really think about how to change it. Okay. David Kasserit, who's a palliative care physician at University of Pennsylvania, wrote a great recent uh, perspective piece in the New England Journal just last month, where he talked about a concept, a psychological concept called the illusion of control. It's been talked about in psychological literature for a long time. And in the medical world, we call it the therapeutic illusion. And the concept is that there's an, we have an unjustified enthusiasm on the part of both patients and doctors, as Dr. Kasserit wrote, for treatment. It's unjustified because it's not helping, but we really are enthusiastic about it, not only the doctors, but the patients too that there's this tendency to infer causality, that we do something and it's going to do something to the patient, when in fact there is none. And he went through a whole bunch of data, which is a very interesting perspective piece, which I would recommend that you take a look at. I'm happy to share my references with people. And so there's this sense that we feel like when things are so out of control and things are just so desperate and people are suffering and people are dying, well, let me do something. Let me, let me try something. It, it, it feels, and it feels not only to you, the doctor, but to the patient too. Well, okay, let's try something. And there, I think, is another. I'm going to go on. I'm going to go through a few different aspects of what might be part of this problem. Here's another one, another deep psychological principle that works, I think, beautifully with the therapeutic illusion, which is avoidance. Okay, I want to see hands here in the audience. Who has actually sat with their family or their parents? and had a really serious conversation about their end-of-life preferences. Whoa, OK. Well, that's actually better than I would think. <laughs> but still, it's less than 50% of you. OK, we don't want to talk about stuff that's difficult to talk about. Death is really hard. And this is a very enlightened crowd. And it's less than 50%. But still, very enlightened crowd. So great, good work. Um, talking about difficult things is really hard. It's messy, it's confusing, it's sad. On top of that, it's really hard for doctors to acknowledge that they can't save somebody. It's so much a part of our culture. It makes us feel like we failed our patient. And here's another thing. We're going to move on to another factor, 
the lay public and what you expect of, of your doctors. Well, of course, there's the therapeutic illusion that I just talked, we just talked about. There's also the collusion of avoidance. But here's another one. Patients like doctors who are more positive. And imagine that you're sitting in a hospital right now and you're really sick and you're scared. And one doctor comes in and says, listen, I'm really sorry. There's nothing that we can do to change the course of this illness. And then imagine another doctor comes in a few minutes later and says, okay, listen, we're gonna try this and then we're gonna try that. Who are you gonna gravitate towards? And don't think that that, I mean, I'm assuming you're, I, I, I know who I would gravitate towards. <laughs> I want the doctor who's gonna try to help me. I mean, maybe I won't now that I know what I know, but still, it's, it's, it's a really powerful human drive. And don't think that that's not lost on your doctors. Doctors know that you want to hear positive things from them. So this study was really interesting. It, patients were asked to observe two videos. They were two different actor doctors. They were standardized so that these doctors behaved the same. They had the same number of empathic statements. They had the same posture. They were trained to do these. And so patients were asked to see these two consecutive. One of them had a negative message, a poor prognosis, and there's not much I can do for this illness. The other was optimistic, even vaguely optimistic. And what was found was that the patients who watched these two videos ranked the optimistic physicians as significantly more compassionate and trustworthy. Okay, here's another thing. I'm gonna go through another one. These procedures are alluring. Are there any doctors? I know one over there who does procedures. Are there any others in here besides me? Okay, okay. So am I not right in saying that this little TV dinner here is really fun to do? I mean, they're fun. They're so, it's like playing Monopoly. It's like little pieces and they really, and you feel competent. You can learn, you know, there's a motto in medicine called see one, do one, teach one. You see it once, then you do it once, and then you teach it. There's a really rapid learning curve. You can get really good at these really quickly. And you feel competent. You walk in there, you do your procedure, you leave. Did the procedure in bed five. It's much easier also to clean up from a procedure like this than to actually clean up from a conversation about bad news, okay? I hope that's not my phone. I don't think it is, but. I guess it's not. <laughs> um, the blue, you know, the, the uncapped needles go in the needle box, the blue drapes go in the garbage, and what you've got after a conversation breaking bad news is a lot of emotional, ethical, and psychological pain and mess and suffering. And that is unpredictable. You don't know how long it's gonna take. You don't know if someone's gonna get angry at you. You don't know if someone's gonna break down in tears. And you don't have a lot of time. And so, here's a question. The doctor's on the top. That's probably, I think that's an endoscopy. I'm not even sure what procedure it is. Or it might be a bronchoscopy. I think it's an endoscopy. And the doctor on the bottom is trying to comfort somebody. How does this play out? You're the doctor. You've been practicing for years to learn a skill. You're competent at it. You're good at it. You're one of the only people who can do this procedure. You're needed. You're valued for that procedure. You get paid a lot of money to do that procedure. And you're facing a patient who's really sick. Okay, and they may be dying, and you've been asked to do a procedure. So would you do the procedure, or would you actually sit down and have an honest conversation with the family and break bad news? Number one, you've never really been trained to do it. I'm a palliative care doctor. I've been doing this for a long time, and I have a hard time doing it. And I can imagine that most of the, if there are any physicians in the audience, I know there's a few, they probably haven't had that much more training than the non-physicians in this audience on how to have these conversations. So it's, you don't feel very competent. They go different ways each time. I've been doing it for 10 years and I still have bad conversations all the time. So what would you do? And I would say most people would do the procedure. I mean, I know, I, sometimes I wish I just could, but now I've kind of gotten into this point where I just I can't do it and so I, I'm filled with anxiety and stress a lot of time at work. But I try to have these conversations even though it's really something that I think is very hard for people to do. Time. 
I want to tell you a quick story. Lack of time. That's a big part of the infrastructural problem, okay? It was a cold afternoon during my pulmonary fellowship. I was pregnant with that person sitting right over there. <laughs> I was tired. It was late in the afternoon. It was 4 o'clock. I had a woman that I'd never met before. I went out to get her from the waiting room. And I still had two patients who were waiting for me, looking impatient. She was cachectic, very, very thin, frail. You could tell she'd been sick for a long time. She had very, very end-stage emphysema. She was on home oxygen. We started walking back towards the room. She had to sit down about every 30 to 45 seconds because she was so winded. And I was dragging a chair along behind us. And when we got to the room, I started to examine her. I looked at her pulmonary function tests, which were dismal. I looked at her blue lips, which were very worrisome. And she was talking about how she wanted to go visit her daughter on the East Coast. And I thought, oh my goodness, this woman is not going to be able to visit her daughter on the East Coast. I really need to have a conversation with her. But I had no time. I had two more patients waiting. And so I made an appointment for her to come back in three weeks. Well, the next week I was called by a co-fellow, and she was intubated in our intensive care unit, and she died on the ventilator. And I had the best of intentions with her, but I just didn't have the time. I didn't have the time to have that conversation. And it was really late in the game. I mean, she'd had this disease for a long time. And she had never had that conversation with anybody about whether or not she'd want to be on a breathing machine. So in summary, the scales are stacked towards intervening rather than talking and communicating. There's the therapeutic illusion. There's avoidance. There's the desire to be liked. There's the desire to feel competent. There's the lack of time. There's compensation issues. There's so many. This is a very complex problem. And it's not just, by the way, for intensive care unit procedures or bronchoscopies. It's also for things like chemotherapy. It's even like for prescribing antibiotics. It's for any type of intervention that we do. We sometimes just hide behind that because it's just easier than actually sitting and having a serious big conversation with our patients. And I just want to tell you a, a, a very quick story. I've got a few more stories, but one story about if you, if you are dubious that this can really happen, I'm going to tell you about a guy who was a very, very well-respected, very powerful, uh, successful businessman in New Jersey, friend of one of my friends. And I was in New Jersey on vacation, and my friend called me and said, oh my goodness, please help my friend. He's, he's completely delirious, and he's suffering, and he's screaming in pain, and his family doesn't know what to do. So I called them, and I ended up going over, and I saw this man who had had pancreatic cancer now for several months, had been on multiple rounds of chemotherapy at a very prestigious place in New York City. Um, and I looked at this man who was wasted and absolutely unable to move and in profound pain, very delirious, and I said to the family, you know, I really think you might want to consider hospice care for him right now to really focus on his symptoms. The wife looked at me aghast. She said, wait, what do you mean? We're, we're, we're going for chemotherapy on Monday. We can't do hospice. We're, we're, we're going to fight. He wants to fight. And I said, I don't think there's any oncologist worth his or her salt who would take a patient this sick and give him chemotherapy. I really don't think it's realistic. Um, shall we call your oncologist together? And she said, oh, no, because it's going to look like we're giving up. I don't want to give up. I don't want him to think we're giving up. My husband wanted to keep fighting. I finally convinced her that we would call him together. She stood in the corner of the room just very anxious, and I was on the phone with this doctor. And it, by the way, she called them their A-team. This was its A-team doctor, and he was a very well-respected, is a very well-respected oncologist in New York City. And I talked to him on the phone, and I said, listen, here's the status, here's the physical situation. This man is really ill. I really believe it may be time for hospice. I know that you are planning more chemotherapy, and obviously you can't do hospice if you're still planning to do chemotherapy. Do you agree that maybe it's time to change courses here? And he went, started to talk about the physiology. Well, I'm not sure. I don't really understand. I said, we need to, this man is suffering right now. Do you feel that it would be appropriate to call in the hospice services? And he said in a very annoyed tone, if they want to use hospice, that's their decision. And you could see the wife kind of recoil as though somehow she had failed and somehow she wasn't doing right by her husband. I said, okay, wait a minute. How about if we think about hospice as a temporary thing, see if we can get him better, and I was about to say, so that he could have some more chemotherapy. And he said, 
well, he's not going to get better. And the wife was listening to this conversation, and she, her face just, she was shocked. She was shocked to hear that this doctor didn't think her husband was going to get better because she had no idea. We called hospice in that afternoon. The patient's symptoms were managed, and he lived for another two days. He was not delirious. His pain was managed, and he was, died listening to opera music in his bed with his wife lying next to him. So it could have been very different. He could have ended up in an intensive care unit on a breathing machine. Information isn't being transferred from doctors and healthcare teams to patients. I'm sure I've by now convinced you of that. But I'm going to give you some data. <clears throat> Only 8% of the geriatrics patient in a Canadian practice had ever talked to their doctors about CPR or resuscitation. Here's another one. Those who know the most, i.e. doctors and nurses, want the least. Okay? So V.S. Pericoil at Stanford in 2014 surveyed 1,000 doctors. 88.3% of them said, do not resuscitate me if I have terminal illness. So 8% of these geriatrics patients had ever even talked to their doctors about resuscitation, whereas 88% of the doctors said, leave me alone if I have terminal illness. That's a big discrepancy. This is, a, <laughs> this is a critical care nurse that I met at a conference at UCSF called Mindfulness in the ICU, which was a, quite a wonderful conference. And it, she was the only person I ever met who actually did this tattoo. <laughs> I've heard many doctors and many nurses threaten to do it, but I'd never actually seen anyone do it, and she let me take a picture of her. But you can see that you know, clearly patients are at a major disadvantage on so many fronts, but mostly, in my mind, it's due to a lack of information, a lack of realistic conversation about where they, what their status is. And they often have no clue what's going on in terms of their prognosis. So, ah, enter palliative care. You've, I, is there anybody in this room who has not heard of palliative care? Yay. That's good. Palliative care is a reasonably new subspecialty. It's about 10 years old. Um, it's been going on for millennia, the practice, but an actual formal subspecialty within the medical culture has been since 2008. 2006, actually. But this subspecialty focuses on communication. A huge part of it is communicating, making sure people understand what is happening? What is their situation? It's all the stuff that I just explained we aren't doing very well, at least in critical care culture, but I suspect in the emergency room and in all the other clinics that or many of them, maybe not geriatrics. It really aims to reduce suffering, suffering from so many different kinds of things, suffering from physical problems, emotional, spiritual. It's an interdisciplinary team in order to treat these different kinds of suffering. Uh, there's, a, there's a chaplain usually, there's a social worker, there's nurses, there's doctors working together collaboratively to take care of patients. A big goal of it is to identify goals of care that are very specific to that particular patient, to understand that patient, their preferences, what's important to them, what's not important to them, and then to create and help the family create uh, medical decisions that are aligned with that goal of care. And it really works especially in the intensive care unit, which as you see is the pinnacle. It's a place where so many dying patients are coming and there's so much technology and there's so much of a potential to do the wrong thing for patients if we're not communicating. So it really makes a difference in the intensive care unit and in many other environments. At this point, we have two decades of compelling data that, it sh that show that palliative care really enhances outcomes, makes people do better in the intensive care unit and lowers the intensity of care, which we talked about as being very high. It doesn't affect mortality in any significant way. It, in other words, it doesn't make patients die sooner just because we've lowered the intensity of care. Uh, it improves symptoms significantly, very high success rate for improving symptoms for patients who receive palliative care. And as you remember from the support trial, so many patients are dying with profound pain and other types of symptoms. It supports the staff to do what they need to do 
There's a lot of support for staff coming in. Well, do you want to have that conversation? Maybe we should have that conversation. Supporting staff to do what they kind of know they want to do, but just don't have that extra support to do. Improves family satisfaction and actually family health, too. The patients and bereaved members do better from, just from a blood pressure perspective. Heart attacks and strokes, there are studies that are coming out showing how much better this, the bereaved family members of dying patients who've had palliative care consults do. It reduces costs, and it interrupts this end-of-life conveyor belt that I've been talking to you about. I'm going to quickly go through some of these slides because I want to leave some room for, for time. But here's some just data on palliative care and, the in, and, and how it affects the intensive care unit. Palliative care consult recipients in the intensive care unit use less ICU days with no change in mortality. Okay, 191 patients, some received palliative care, some didn't. And the ones who received palliative care had an average of nine days in the ICU. The ones who didn't receive it, 16 days. Okay. Here's another study. Communication decreases the time on life support. So these were 230 very sick, mechanically ventilated patients, and their surrogate decision makers were interviewed. And those surrogate decision makers who had more understanding of what was going on, they had a higher score on the quality of communication scale they used 12% less time on life-sustaining treatment. Here's an old study from the New England Journal. More knowledge about CPR, less interest in it. Okay, So most people overestimate the likelihood of survival following CPR. When it's explained to them, they are less likely to want it by half. So where does that leave us? <clears throat> Our ICU patients need a lot more than our procedures. They really need information. They need communication, compassionate communication, but they need communication. They need to know where they're at, as people say. They need to know what's going on. A consulting palliative care is a wonderful way to get that support for patients. And I think it's, I've proven that, I hope, and I really hope that people are not a lot of doctors in this audience, but I hope in the hospitals that you go to, palliative care really has gained entrance into the intensive care unit. But most importantly, we all doctors need to look at our inner cycle, and, and not just doctors, but all of us, lay people, because you, you've heard about your tendencies and wanting a nice doctor, wanting somebody who's going to do something, the technological imperative, the therapeutic, um, I can't remember the name, you, we need to look at these inner psychological tendencies and really start to try to unwind them. We doctors should consult palliative care, certainly, but we also need to start doing better at communicating ourselves with our patients. We cannot rely on the palliative care community. There's not enough of them, quite frankly. There's too many patients who have need, and so we must start doing it, even non-palliative care physicians, more effectively. And I'm going to tell you, this is my... My last slide, let's not hide behind our, technolo our technologies, our drugs, our stethoscopes. Our patients really deserve the best information in order to make the best choices for themselves. And I'm going to end with one more story. OK. And if you want to see extremis, this patient is in the movie. I had a patient with progressive neuromuscular dysfunction. It was an inherited disease. And she was just becoming weaker and weaker and weaker over months months. There wasn't anything. There was no infection. There was nothing acute. There was nothing for us to turn around or change. She was just getting weaker. She was 57 years old, and many people in her family had already died on breathing machines from this very disease. She, when I first met her, was on a breathing machine because she had become so weak that she had gone into respiratory failure and gotten resuscitated, was on a breathing machine. And she was on the schedule to receive a tracheostomy because the team realized this woman is getting progressively weak, and she is probably unlikely to get better on her own. But let's try the trach, and let's do all the other stuff that we can do, and hopefully we can get her to that point. So she was on the schedule for the trach, actually, the next day when I first came on service. And we sat down and talked. I talked with her brother, who knew her very well. And she had told him multiple times that she didn't want to be on a breathing machine. She didn't want to die on a breathing machine for sure, but she didn't really want to be on a breathing machine. And he had done it because she was an extremist. 
She was really dying. The paramedics had come. She had gotten whisked in. There was no pulse. There was no DNR. She had gotten put on a breathing machine, and here she was in the ICU. They had tried a few time to, tr times before to extubate her, and she was just too weak. So now they were planning to put the trach in. And her brother thought, OK, well, let's just do this procedure because it's going to make her more comfortable. You know, the tube, the temporary breathing tube goes through the mouth. It's very uncomfortable. This would go into the neck. And it's easier to clean the mouth, and it just feels better. And so he thought, OK, well, let's try that. And I know she didn't want to be on this, but let's at least try this. And the doctors think it's going to help. And when we sat down and started talking about the likelihood of her actually being able to come off of that trach eventually, and, and the fact that it was actually quite low, her brother started to say, wait a minute. You know what? I don't think it would be acceptable to her to live on a breathing machine at all. She, she told me not to intubate her in the first place. And so the decision was eventually made to actually extubate her and let her pass away. And it was very painful and very hard, but it was really based on what she had been very clear about. And, and the next day, she actually had perked up a little bit, and she was able to participate in the conversation herself. And she did not want it. She wanted the tube out. So we took the tube out, and her brothers came, and she was with her family. And she actually, when the tube out, she came out, she gave us thumbs up. And then you know, she said at one point to her daughter, tell everybody to just calm down. <laughs> And then she had 24 beautiful hours. And I was told, although I wasn't there when she died, that she was in her bed, and her brother was standing behind her and brushing her hair, and she just died. And it was, I went to her funeral, which was beautiful. And the funeral was a complete celebration of this woman. It was a celebration of her life, which was quite amazing. And it was really a celebration of her death, which she designed and which people honored. And I realized in those moments that I can have the same kind of feeling that I have when I save someone's life, when I save someone's death. So that's it. Happy to. Happy to. Does anyone have any questions? Oh. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for this uh, lovely and important talk. Um, so uh, I used to be a psychiatrist once upon a time, did a lot of consultation liaison work. And uh, two things were very interesting to me. One is if a patient refused treatment, they called the psychiatrist because clearly there was something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid that still mm -hmm. happens. The second thing is that um, in teaching medical students, it's usually very easy in the first couple of preclinical years to get students to talk about the need for communication and to think about the psychosocial issues, et cetera. Once they get into the clinical years and start the residency programs, whichever residency disappears Absolutely like that. Agree. So the real dilemma, the real challenge is how do you influence residency programs in any way to pay more attention to the communicative issues. We now talk about cultural competence and all these things. But often what happens is, oh, let's get the social worker in to talk to the patient because that's not my job and I don't have time. Oh, yeah. So when you talk about therapeutic illusions, I mean, patients often have this optimistic perspective and want optimistic do doctors because the psychological problems lie in the system, which allows the doctors to avoid these issues and which raises patient expectations. I think you should come up here and give that talk. <laughs> You're, I totally agree with you. In fact, right at the back of the room is um, the director of the joint medical program, Amy Garland. Um, and I, I, I really, oh, you did? <laughs> it's Coder. She's she, as good as the director. Anyways, I, I really think that this is, is critically important. I think the, the first and second year, you can, you've, got the, you've got them. They're humanistic. They, we all go into medicine humanistic. We care about people. We're there to help. And something happens, and we get dumped on the wards in the third and fourth year, and we are, all of a sudden, we become doctors, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really different, and we, we sort of shut ourselves off. First of all, we're very stressed. We're very tired. We're very, very burdened by the anxiety of taking care of dying patients. It's very hard. And you just want to get small. Mm 
So it is a systemic problem and it's a real issue and I think it has to be addressed both from a medical student training perspective, really starting early <coughs> and getting these medical students to understand the critically important, the, the responsibility and the expectation that they're going to maintain a sense of patient-centeredness because it, the modeling that they get when they go in their third and fourth year is just really on the wards, it's just terrible. So I, I totally agree with you, 100%. I'm gonna let you choose because I don't Oh. I don't want to pick yeah, favorites. Well, go to the other side over <laughs> here. So I'll just keep switching back and forth. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, it, it's helping me personally refine my thinking about this, about what I want to do personally and how I want to interact with my family. One of the questions I, I well, a question I have is sort of what the cultural and racial issues are in this process. There have been studies done that show that um, medical people, particularly physicians, have biases, you know, unconscious biases mm -hmm. that come out in terms of the kinds of procedures that they offer or don't offer to patients, for instance, of color, mm -hmm. which um, can, you know, raises sus suspicions often for patients of color. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder what you might be able to say uh, about that. I mean, it's a huge issue. And I won't claim to be a complete expert on it. I do work at Highland Hospital, where many of my patients are patients of color, um, who really have not been treated well and have been disenfranchised and not gotten their fair share. And, and we all remember Tuskegee, the Tuskegee experiments. And we, you know, there are a lot of things that have happened in the name of our medical culture that have lost the trust of a lot of people, um, and I think rightly so. Um, and I know, you know, when I walk in with my white skin and I'm trying to take care of a patient, I know that there is a, especially if I'm talking to them about what are the options and maybe it's, maybe this type of in continuing technology is not necessarily indicated right now, or maybe let's talk about your goals. There is a, a suspicion and it's heartbreaking for me um, to think that somebody might think, I mean, there are biases. I'm sure I have my own biases that I, I mean, I'm not going to claim to not. I, there, we, Cultural humility is the name of the game, but it's really a problem, and it's really important that I mean I, that we that we learn as much as we can about this problem, and that we try to be as culturally sensitive to we, as we can, and that we have people on our teams who can who are of color. Honestly, and on a palliative care team, we have an African American woman uh, who, honestly, a lot of times when I get a sense that someone is really not trusting me, they're much more comfortable with her, and I and I. You know, it's very tricky. It's a very tricky problem, and I am not going to claim to have complete answers for it, but I do know. I also know that African Americans, you know, there was a Pew Research study in 2013 which looked at end-of-life preferences in America and, and how people are dying, and actually preferences. And it's true that people, African Americans, prefer die and pre pre say that they prefer to have more technology. And why that is is so complicated. There's religious reasons, there's trust reasons, there's a sense of having been deprived for so long. And it's really complex and I'm not even going to claim to really understand the depth of it myself. I just do the best that I can and it's, it's not a perfect system. But I thank you for the question. It also may be that you want more, more technology because you feel like it might be of help. Absolutely. And I think that's true. One thing that I've been told by our chaplain is that she knows that a lot of African American people feel that they're being experimented on, which is a problem, and they feel that they're being deprived of treatments that would be offered to white people. And it's, it's, it's so, and it's different from person to person, by the way. Um, I had a patient, very quickly, um, an African American man who had very, very bad COPD. This was when I was in Newark. And he was there with his son, and we had long, long conversation. He was on a breathing machine. We were not going to be able to get him off the breathing machine. And we spent a lot of time talking about who he was and what was important to him and what kind of a person he was. And he was a very social guy. He was the center of the community. And it really was important to him. To, and he was very much a part of this conversation. And we talked about all the different options and what it would be like to trach him and what it would be like for him to live in a vent facility. And he decided, and his son, that it wasn't going to be what he wanted and that we were going to extubate him. And as I was getting, I mean, we were hours of conversation. And as I was getting up to leave from the final decision, his son said, Doc, can you just meet with me out in the, in the hallway for a second? And we walked out. And he said, I just have to ask you, are you doing this to save money? <laughs>
And I just, I mean, I just felt this pit in my stomach because obviously I, I wasn't. I was really trying to honor this man's preferences. But just to think that there was that sneaking suspicion was just heartbreaking to me. And it's real. So thank you for asking the question. Oh, I'll let you. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. <laughs> but can everybody hear me or not? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, I see. Um, I lost my train of thought. Okay, first off, thank you. Uh, secondly, does Highland have a training program um, to, um, you know, enhance communication between doctors and patients? Uh, That's second. Uh, or, and secondly, are you familiar with the new legislation Governor Brown signed in October, the PAD, mm -hmm. Physician Assisted Death? Because I think that what you're saying is going to become increasingly important uh, for providers to have um, that crucial conversation with patients. Uh, particularly with the growing uh, dementia patients who uh, maybe are no longer able to make uh, decisions for themselves. Thank you. Two great questions. Well, one, actually, Dr. Alter, who's back in the audience and, and, and I are trying to come up with a program at Highland that will be some sort of a systemic approach to changing the way that we train our residents and do communication. So it is in many places, even UCSF, even the Brigham and Women's Hospital, they're really still rudimentary programs. It's very, it's a new, it's a new phase. It's really, this is all new realization. The issue about physician-assisted death, I'll tell you, as a palliative care doctor, my experience personally is one of really being successful in managing patients from, with their symptoms. And I have never had a patient, actually, uh, who really considered or, would have, or was asking for uh, assisted death. Now, obviously, this is just a recent uh, thing. I still think, based on the, inf the information we know from, from Oregon and, and Washington, and I guess it's Montana is the other one? I don't remember. The, there's one more state. It's such a small percentage of patients, honestly, who are, for whom that option is going to be something that they want. I think it's, I think it's I'm happy it's there. But it's not something that I choose to focus on because I really do personally want to focus more on what we can do to enhance the life of patients. And, and really that small minority of patients, I'm happy that there's an option for them, but it's not really something that I focus on very much when I, when I talk. But thank you for asking. So we have two more questions. Five, four questions. Well, thank you for your talk. Um, I, in the last year and a half, I went through an experience where my mother died. Um, she was 92. And we were surprised that her condition got worse. Um, and <clears throat> the first reaction people might have with that is, oh, well, she's 92. What do you expect? But um, if she had lived a year uh, longer, we would have you know, appreciated. In other words, it was valued. She had valued life. She had a, a group of family that that are, are liked her to participate in our lives. Yet, when she had pulmonary problems, that turned out. Um, but if they had done a test, which was the CO2 gas test, to t and we would have known that her lungs were failing. Instead, we were just given the oxygen level, which could be increased with the uh, with a you know, uh, oxygen uh, intake. So uh, in this case, we felt in a way betrayed by the uh, medical because um, just this perspective I think is, is useful because people said, well, including her doctor who was there at the uh, facility she lived at, she's 90, what do you expect? She's going to die. In other words, they just looked at her as an old person. Mm and uh, one who's on that conveyor belt. Mm. And we, all we needed to, and she was, she was a medical technologist, she understood, med she was a, anyway, she understood her condition and she did not want to be resuscitated, she did not want to be in a breathing machine, she was very clear about that. So she was an active person in her mm. care. If we'd had that information, we would have known that she was dying Right. Instead, we just thought she was sick, yeah. and that makes that makes a difference, um, and especially the two things: stereotyping someone who's old, of course, and then the lack of information by a pulmonologist 
basically ordering a test that would be definitive about what's going on. Absolutely. So I'm sorry to go on that long, but I, I think that there is, in a sense, ageism about that. And since people are going to be living longer, anyway, yeah. that's. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry about that experience. I'm an English trained physician. I notice Americans are very litigious. My, I'm sorry, say that again? You're, you're an English trained physician? And yeah, I'm sorry. And I notice that Americans are very litigious. My previous wife died in my arms in my house. She had a cerebral hemorrhage. She was brain dead. She'd had a tracheotomy for 10 years. And after a while, I realized that she was relatively young and you might be able to transplant her kidneys. So I phoned up the hospital and said, can Marcia die in the hospital? And I remember saying to them, if you don't follow our end of life directives, I will sue you. Has anybody ever sued an ICU for keeping a person alive and torturing them? Well, there was recently the case in Texas uh, <clears throat> with the woman who, what was her name? The paramedic who had said that she wanted to be um, DNR, DNI, and she had been resuscitated, she was completely brain dead, she was pregnant, and they were keeping her alive, and she only had, it was, the, the fetus was nine weeks old, so it wasn't even legally in the state of Texas a, a thing. So they, she, they were sued, and she, uh, I don't know if they actually were sued for damages, but they were required to allow her to be released from life support. So it, it, it uh, was a very grisly case. But. What became of your relationship with Pat Murphy? <laughs> <laughs> Pat's one, Pat and I are doing a session uh, at the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Care Medicine next year together about training programs, training critical care doctors. Uh, Pat's been a big part of my life since that time. Yeah. <laughs>